What's up my friends, welcome back to another video and today we are taking a look at the percussion section. I've done a couple of videos before on the channel regarding the percussion section, but uh, I, th I think the topic itself is quite expansive and quite varied and plus a lot of beginner composers I think get a little bit confused on the topic as well. So in this video I want to share with you my personal approach to percussion and I want to share with you a couple of practical examples of how I use them in my music. So by the end of this video you should have a great idea of how to actually use it for yourself and go from there. So let's dive in. Uh, before we really get into the nitty gritty, I want to give you something free to start things off. Uh, this is my free guide called Orchestration Essentials, and this is basically a general overview of how I personally approach orchestration. So in this guide, we cover the core five steps to approach every arrangement with, a key way of thinking about the orchestra properly, so in a more musical way, and I'll also provide tips for creative arranging for unique textures and colors, uh, kind of straying from just traditional combinations that you might be used to, you know? And finally, I'll also give you bonus recommendations for ear candy to spice up your existing mockup and complete the orchestration. So to download this free guide, just click the first link in the description box below and it, it'll take you over to where you can download it as my gift to you. Uh, really valuable stuff. I, I really hope it, it'll help you. So, you know, you, you really have no reason not to give or have it. Um, yeah, let, let me know if that helps you out. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's dive into percussion specifically. So why percussion? Why are we talking about percussion? So uh, first of all, it does play a very essential role in the orchestra. I think a lot of times it's underrated by a lot of people because we get caught up in, you know, legato, sample libraries, uh, melodic instruments, making the tone sound as good as possible. And a lot of the times we kind of neglect percussion because we think of it as the foundation of the orchestra, fine, but it feels kind of basic and not very interesting, you know? But on the contrary, it is quite interesting. There's so many things you could do with it. It essentially lays the rhythmic foundation, as we just mentioned, but it can also provide decoration in certain moments. And this is one of my favorite uses of percussion is literally to decorate or enhance an existing moment in my mock-up. So it just adds that spark and it makes it really, really special. It also has the widest variety out of all the orchestral sections. So, you know, strings, there's five different instruments. The woodwinds have four or five. The brass also have around four or five. But for percussion, you have up to like 20 or more uh, instruments that you can choose from. And there's so many colors there to have fun with. In addition, it can be a little bit confusing, I think, because rhythm in general is one of those things that is not properly taught in a lot of schools and academics. So, uh, yeah, maybe it's confusing for a, a, you know a few composers starting out, or maybe you're you're writing for a while, but you want some more interesting rhythms, and you're not quite sure how to accomplish that. Uh, that could be a great reason why you want to study percussion a little bit more. And just overall, it's fun to write for. You know, um, again, we talked about there's so many options, but there's also so many rhythmic aspects you can go with. I, I personally like to keep things simple myself in my music. And, uh, you know, to keep things interesting, I will throw in the occasional, uh, you know, I'll spice things up with a, a different rhythm here and there. But overall, I do like to keep the experience simple. So I'll approach it from that standpoint. Uh, but generally, you can do lots of things with the percussion section and really any other section for that matter. But let's cover the core three areas of percussion. So I like to think of them in groups according to frequencies. So we have the lows, the mids, and the highs. When you think of it in this kind of way, it makes it a lot simpler, right? Rather than thinking, oh, there's 20 different instruments and I, I don't know which one to choose for my which context, uh, maybe for my piece uh, or my, my track, thinking about it in low, mid, and high and categorizing those instruments in these categories really helps simplify things. So yeah, there are different instruments that cover each area, but there are also some that are all encompassing. So let's share a couple of examples of each. All encompassing ones, in my opinion, include piano, celeste, and marimba. Uh, these are uh, like, well, piano and celeste are more keyboard based instruments. So they have kind of a wider range and uh, you can play some pretty low notes and pretty high notes of these instruments. And the marimba is another tonal instrument that sounds beautiful, but it also can go pretty low and also pretty high as well. Then we go on to the dedicated low instruments. So these would include things like the timpani, which is a tonal bass drum. You can think of it like that. Then we have the regular bass drum, which is atonal or non-tonal. Then we have the toms, which uh, if you think about a drum kit with the toms, it kind of has a similar approach there. And then we have the gran casa, which is like a huge, huge drum, uh, kind of similar to bass drum in, in the way I think about it. But it provides a beautiful emphasis and just a really weighted sound in the orchestra. 
Then moving on to the midsection, we have the snare drum, which you can imagine in the military sense, it has a very strict rhythmic uh, element. We have the chimes, we have the claps, you know, but you know, we can, we can clap, we can stomp our feet, but yeah, th these are some of the mid elements that I like to use. And then for highs, some uh, things like cymbals, clashing them together, we have the tambourine, uh, the glockenspiel, the xylophone, the vibraphone, and the triangle. These all provide really beautiful decorations and emphasis on specific situations. So the way I specifically use percussion myself is for the low percussion, uh, I like to use the non-tonal percussion specifically, like the bass drum, to establish accents and emphatic moments. Like if, I, if I'm rising up to a climax, if I'm crescendoing in a certain passage and I'm landing in a new beat or a new bar, then I definitely want that moment to be felt more, right? So I'll most likely use a bass drum to emphasize that downbeat. Then I'll use tonal percussion, like the timpani, for example, to highlight key bass notes that I really want to be brought out. So maybe the harmonic rhythm of this passage is increased. There's more chords happening within a specific time period, and I want to share that, or I want to show that a little bit more easily, make it more prevalent to the listener. So I will use the timpani to kind of outline those bottom bass notes to establish that harmonic foundation just a little bit more. Then we have the mid percussion, right? So this is great for setting the overall rhythmic foundation, like the snare drum, usually happens a little bit quicker uh, than the regular uh, bass drum or kick drum, you could say. Uh, you could also use it for a more adventurous or military feel. Think of it as da 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 like that type of thing, right? So it, it can go quite fast there. But let's say for a, a kick drum, or sorry, for a drum kit, it, it would just basically play like the backbeat, like the two and the four, for example. So lots of variety that you can use for those mid percussion elements. Then for the highs, we have the non-tonal and tonal as well. For the non-tonal, I like to establish accents and emphatic moments similar to the low percussion. And with the tonal ones like Glock and tubular bells, I like to use them to decorate the rest of the orchestra or double melodies. So because they kind of have a sound that, you know, attacks, but then tails off gradually, um, they can really serve to emphasize certain key notes in melodies or even just you know, counter melodies, playing within certain lines uh, in a very beautiful way. And that it adds a sense, of, a sense of texture that you don't get from the other orchestral sections. So you can take, really take advantage of those properties. But all in all, they all belong to an expansive color palette to choose from. And in my opinion, it's just so much fun to write for because you can get super creative with it and uh, you can come up with some really beautiful combinations that you might not have thought of before. So quick bonus here, let's talk about the drum kit really quickly. Because we've been talking about, you know, the traditional orchestral percussion, which again has like those 20 instruments and so on. But the drum kit is, I consider just one instrument. And it must tackle all three areas, low, mid, and high within one instrument. If you look, think about a drum kit, right? It's all one unit. You know, you, you can screw the units together, you can disassemble it. But when it's all said and done, the entire drum kit is one whole instrument that you can make music from. So... One of the core elements here is the kick drum, very similar to the bass drum in the symphony orchestra. The kick drum sets the foundational beat, typically on the beats one and three in a rock setting or pop setting, and it just creates this rhythmic emphasis that sets the foundation for the track. Then on the opposite side, you have the snare drum, which sets the back beat or the two and the four, which are the typical weak beats. So this fills in the gaps between the strong beats. If you just have a basic boom, tsh, boom, then you would just have that traditional uh, you know, rock beat or pop beat, right? Then you have the other elements like the hi-hat and the cymbals, which are used for the rhythmic aspects and the emphasis respectively. So hi-hats, they can play like 16th, 1 E and a 2 E and a 3 E and a 4 E and a, so that provides more rhythm. And then the cymbals, you maybe like roll on the cymbals or you crash the cymbals together or you hit it hard with your drumstick. Uh, that creates a nice emphasis on certain beats you might want. So lots of variety there. And then finally, we have the toms, which perform fills like do 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 right? So that those uh, fills lead us to the next section, and they create those beautiful transition moments that maybe uh, it, you know increases the excitement and just builds that tension that is released when you go into the next bar. So finally, let's talk about the key to interesting rhythms. We talked about the elements of the percussion section, but how do you kind of apply those, right? So in addition to the core beats, like the one and three and the two and the four, you also want to throw in syncopation. So what is syncopation, you might be asking? Well, it's essentially when you stress the weak beats or the off beats to add emphasis in unexpected areas within your groove. So if we were 
playing like let's say an eighth note pattern like one and two and three and four and right you might want to accent the and of b2 for example so this would go one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and what if you stress all of the ands? One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. So it creates that kind of funky rhythm or it, it kind of makes you feel like you lurch forward. It creates an entirely different feel altogether. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You can really go all in on this and go super creative with your rhythms. Um, and in terms of sample libraries, you can of course turn up and down certain velocities on those percussion instruments to create that syncopation and that stress on those moments. So it, it's super interesting uh, to use syncopation because that creates that unexpected feeling that you don't get with a traditional beat. And yeah, different genres use syncopation differently to create their distinct flavors, right? So the way a rock musician might apply syncopation would be different than a jazz big, big band drummer, for example, versus a pop drummer or a funk drummer, right? They, they place those accents and those downbeats and offbeats on different places and use syncopation accordingly to create a really distinct feel for that genre of music. And it can be accomplished using really any percussion instrument, but in my experience, I've heard the syncopation applied mainly to like mid-high instruments in the drums, so it's a little bit more easily audible, like the snare or the hi-hat. Uh, you can really hear that emphasis very clearly the higher those frequencies are. So just, just in my experience, those are kind of what I felt um, personally. Now, let's check out a couple of examples. I want to show you actually three examples of percussion in different contexts. So the first one will be in my song Empty Holes, which kind of has a poppy Disney style with vocals and is primarily reliant on a drum kit because it's more of a poppy context and more of a band feeling. Then I'll show you a track called Path to Freedom, and this is more of an orchestral track that you might hear in a Disney park. Uh, it features more traditional percussion. It does not have a drum kit. And then finally, I'll show you my track Love's Rapture, which is basically a romantic ballad. So it's not very rhythmic, but it does have some percussion there as well, but just a little bit more sparse. So without further ado, let's jump into Empty Holes and have a listen. All right, so here we are in Empty Holes. Um, I'm just going to show you the pr second pre-chorus to uh, through, through to the chorus, and then I'll solo up the percussion and we can talk about what's going on there. So have a listen. Cause it all looks brighter when you look a little farther Praying for a better day Should you keep to yourself Where no one can help To chase the demons away Okay, let's pause it there. So yeah, you can you can essentially hear how the percussion is mainly driven by the drum kit. So let's go back to the pre-chorus. Let's solo up the percussion and have a listen. So you can see here, I have two drum tracks. They're essentially the exact same thing, but just two different drum kits that I layered together with the same rhythm. But you hear the kick drums on essentially the one and the three. One, three, one. Three, right, and I've I've spiced it up a bit. It's kind of going, dun 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 dun. So it's playing on some of the off beats as well. So it creates that syncopation with the kick drum, but we also have the snares on the two and the four. Two, three, four, one, right. And then in addition to that, because it's still an orchestral based song, I have additional instruments. So the cymbals here on those down beats, the ch, right. Then the timpani emphasizes some of the low bass notes. Right there, it, it, it played a low F to really uh, emphasize that F minor chord. And then we have the snare drum, which I'll have a quick listen to that. So it's basically just emphasizing even more the two and the four with the drum kit. Right? So that's happening there. In addition, we also have the snaps, which I did pan a little bit to the left. So to create some stereo width there, 
but that kind of contrasts with the snare happening on the right. Then we have the shaker, which is happening on the right. This, I treat this as kind of like the hi-hat for the traditional orchestral section. So we have some hi-hats here in the drums as well, I believe, but you can just hear how that shaker adds a bit of movement as well. Then the tubular bells serve kind of a similar function to the um, similar function to the timpani in a way that it's accenting certain moments. I kind of just sprinkled it in here and there where I wanted to emphasize maybe a certain moment where I'm taking a breath in the vocal melody. But overall, it just provides a slightly more cinematic color that you wouldn't get if you didn't have it. So let's have a listen one more time, just this percussion section to the chorus. So really emphasizing the first beat there and then another F chord. And then a flat chord, right? So really establishing those beats, keeping this nice groove with the drum kits layered together. Even if we've got a way to walk. But the main elements that are creating more of a rhythmic texture overall, of course, with the drum kits, but then we also have the shakers, which are basically playing 16s, like 1E e and a 2E e and a 3E e and a 4E. E and, and then we have a couple elements also to emphasize the 2 and the 4 a bit more, the snaps and the snares on opposite sides. And those are giving the snare drum in the drum kit just a bit more weight that, uh, that kind of carries the piece forward a bit more, makes those beats a little bit stronger. So that's how I would use it in more of a poppy context myself. It, it's kind of like a hybrid approach between, you know, regular drum kit and the traditional percussion, but I kind of wanted to show it with, to you in this type of context. So that is my song, Empty Holes. If you want to hear the final thing, it's on the channel, but yeah, that's just how I use percussion in this example. So uh, let's take a listen to Path to Freedom and I'll show you how I used it there. All right, so this is Path to Freedom. Um, again, it's more of a Disney style adventure track. I, I have the MIDI files, or the, sorry, the MIDI tracks up here, and then I've got more of the audio files down here for mixing. But uh, yeah, let me just kind of play through the first little bit. I'll show you the um, what the piece sounds like, and then we'll solo those up and just hear the percussion specifically. So uh, have a quick listen to this. Okay, cool. So let's stop there. Um, yeah, so you get the general vibe of this. There's no drum kit here, but we still get that rhythmic element and it's still kind of flowing. So why is that, right? Well, very similar to the drum kit, we have the kick drum, or in this case, we have the bass drum, which provides that foundation. So it sounds like this when we solo it. Dun, dun, da, 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 right? Dun, dun, da, da, da. So that's that da 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 like that that's kind of the rhythm I kind of went for there but it does drive it forward and it gives it that foundation. So in contrast to that I also wanted the snare. The snare is definitely playing a more regular rhythm here so. So roll leading into actually the same rhythm as the bass drum, right? 1 2 3 4 But you notice there's not anything really playing on the ends of the beats. So it's going 1 one and two and three and four and, right? So nothing is really playing on the and of the two and the four right now, which is not giving us any backbeat. So how do we fix that problem? We actually need something like the snare and the tom. Just, I had those two instruments layered together. So it sounds like this. So one and two and three and four and, right? So then we get that emphasis there. So that's the basic foundation of the beat. Then we get the remaining elements, cymbals. And of course we get the timpani, which is the tonal drum, tonal bass drum. 
emphasizing certain notes that I wanted to bring out even more. We have the Glock that's doing the opposite, doing decoration on the top end of the uh, of the uh, percussion section. So you hear those little tinkles, right? It just provides that decoration. Now here, the snare drum is also doing another kind of pattern on the one and to all, all of the ends, essentially. So yeah, all of that kind of combined together with the bass drum, and then we have the snare drum kind of playing the same rhythm at the beginning. Then we have the snare and tom playing or emphasizing those ands on the twos and the fours, timpani cymbals and glock providing more decoration, going into certain climactic moments, uh, you know, really reinforcing the the emphasis there. And then throughout, yeah, that's kind of the same approach I did. Um, but yeah, overall, a very simple approach here to the percussion as well, but it kind of works because the percussion itself is a little bit unique in its own pattern. Dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, da, da, da. I went for that instead of something just like one and two and three and four and one, two. So just like a straight rhythm, that would be a bit boring, but going with this gives it a bit of variety. So that's how this, this one kind of works. And then finally, let's take a look at Love's Rapture. Again, there won't be a steady beat, but you'll see how I use percussion a little bit more delicately in a ballad situation. All right, so here we are in the third and final example called Love's Rapture. Uh, this one is, again, a more of a ballad, so there won't be a ton of percussion. You can see here, I really only have these three percussion elements. So I'll play it for you really quickly through um, the chorus, basically, the loud section, and then we'll kind of break that down, the percussion section. Cool, and we'll stop it there. So yeah, again, just really only three elements. The main ones are the bass drum and the timpani. So the bass drum, again, is the atonal low drum uh, that really provides that emphasis on the downbeat, so. Right, and then in combination, I layered that with the timpani, which it serves the same purpose as the bass drum, but just provides that foundation of the harmony as well. So I kind of rolled into it on the dominant C going into an F downbeat. And the simples provide that high element, so. And then I let the instruments play. More timpani to emphasize certain moments. That's a D minor chord. B flat chord, and then roll. Back into the downbeat of the F chord. And then more timpani here. Right, I really want the, the listener to hear those chords. So sometimes less really is more. Uh, you really just have to think, like what effect am I trying to accomplish by pulling in this certain instrument? And this is something I always share with my students. Like don't feel like you have to overcomplicate things. Uh, again, less is more. The instruments you choose have to have a certain purpose. You don't just want to add in instruments for the sake of having a more impressive looking uh, arrangement, you know, or mix or whatever. So always be thinking about the purposes of each instrument, and that will give you a lot of clarity in the actual arrangement, because then you'll have a, a, a specific focus for each element or instrument that you're putting in. So hopefully that makes sense. And uh, th again, these are just three different examples of my percussion uses. Hopefully it gives you a little bit of clarity and some ideas on how you can use it yourself. And uh, if you have any specific questions about the percussion, just let me know in a comment below and I'll do my best to help out there. And again, if you want a framework, a step-by-step -step framework on how to approach your orchestrations in general, then I do want to give you my orchestration essentials guide. Again, it's hundred percent free. It kind of goes over the necessary steps that you need to be thinking about and taking when you are going through your own MIDI mockups. It's super valuable. It's helped a lot of my students already. And they've told me personally that they've had a lot of clarity after going through this material. 
Um, so I, I know it's valuable and I really, really, really want you to have it. So uh, yeah, just click the first link in the description box below. You can grab it as my gift to you and I hope you enjoy. Keep it uh, wherever you want for uh, you know your own reading whenever you're whenever you have a few minutes. So thanks again, my friend. I'll catch you in the next video and take care. Bye-bye.